Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. Uh, I am Zach, your show companion, usually through the world of leftist literature, but tonight I'm doing something a little different. I'm trying to get my uh, streaming days up so that potentially I can make affiliate at some point. So here I have uh, a different sort of stream than, than what you're usually going to see. Uh, tonight you're going to be doing kind of the React Andy sort of thing. I have my, my lovely wife Amanda over here to help me uh, get through some of these videos. Um, some of them will be from leftists, some will be from the right that we will, you know, kind of make fun of and whatever. And it's just going to be kind of more of a, a chill kind of hangout sort of thing. Uh, no, no real big structure. Um, if you have any uh, requests for videos or anything like that, um, I don't allow links in the chat, but you can kind of uh, tell me you know, just the title of the video and I can look it up on, on YouTube or whatever, if you like. Uh, otherwise, you know, just kind of hang out and, and chill and, you know, uh, come along with us as, as we look at some, some cool stuff. So, you ready to go? Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's start looking at some cool videos. Now, the first one we're going to look at, I think, is going to be uh, one of Hassan who is critiquing uh, Ben Shapiro buying Ann Wood at the Home Depot uh, to show how much of a, a big manly man he is that he can uh, support corporations that, that don't buy into the wokest mentality. So let's let's hear what he has to say. I didn't even talk about Ben Shapiro's Wood. Okay, I got to talk about that first, dude. This is my favorite video on the internet okay here's your daily nose of the internet this, Here, this is all it. right as you can see i just went shopping at home depot you should do the same this one this one even this magnificent poplar is now mine you might be wondering to yourself like why the fuck is ben shapiro first of all how did ben oh he lives in nashville now i was gonna say how did he find a home depot in los angeles remembered that he's in nashville now so it's different Secondly, you might be thinking to yourself, why is this fucking wood in a bag? And lastly, why is Ben Shapiro looking kind of tight with it? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, he's got the fucking weekend dad energy, like, you know, tucking his fucking t-shirt into his uh yeah, into his jeans you, but uh yeah. apparently Ben Shapiro went to Ben's Home Depot and bought a one dollar uh, thing of wood. This magnificent piece of popcorn is now mine. Like, what are you gonna do with that? I mean, listen, here's the thing, okay? I I'm not like a manly man, okay? I'm not like a big burly bro. Marat is that guy. He knows what to do with this, okay? But what are you going to do with one single piece of wood? Like, what would you be doing with this? Like, I just don't understand why you would get, like, like one thing. Uh, uh, one plank, please. Hello, I'm Ben Shapiro. I'm going to Home Depot today. I would like a single plank, please. Yes, make sure you bag it for me. Like, what? what's the reason? Well, what are you going to make with that one single plank, dude? Well, the real reason why he did it is because he's going to fucking, you know, he's just doing this to, for this reason. Here's the context uh, for those of you who are wondering, like, why is Bench People at Home Depot? Why is he doing a hashtag ad for Home Depot? Here we are at Home Depot. As you know, controversy has now involved Home Depot as people are. He says some real, I'm smoking some meat, uh, Mark Zuckerberg energy right here. This is like, it's funny when you see people who are just like very clearly out of touch in a situation and like very clearly not in their element, try to fucking act like a human would in the situation. Like, you know what? Let's try that. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, like, I have, a, someone should be able to pull that video yeah, out of, of Mark Zuckerberg you. talking so. about how he makes, how he smokes okay. uh, meat. Oh, here, here it is. Hey, everyone. We are live from smoking a brisket and some ribs. I love this video because, like, he bought out the block. This motherfucker bought the entire block, right? So he has no houses like near him because he bought all of his neighbor's houses and shit, I think, boy. right? Didn't he do that? Meanwhile, like he's out here making it seem like he lives in, like, one of those, like, little apartments in San Francisco where he has, like, you know, uh, uh, a fence right behind him. Yeah, someone asked me, do I smoke meat? Smoking meat. Smoking these meats. Smoking meats earlier in the day. Smoking these meats. Just set the charcoal up and you set the... The wood chips up and then smoking meats grilling grilling meats good smoky flavor it's like what are you doing dude what are you doing why is ben at home depot well it's not because he needed that single wood plank that he purchased obviously home depot as you know controversy has now involved home depot as people are encouraging people to boycott home depot because home depot is not getting involved in georgia's voter law controversy from people doing exactly the right thing because so, so that's the 
the real reason he's buying a piece of wood is that they're not uh, getting involved in voter controversy. They're not taking a stand on it at all. So, yeah, what a, what a stand he's taking there by buying a single plank. I'm sure that really is boosting their profits and everything. It's just not because much. After all, they are in fact both. They are not in fact in the business of politics because you should be buying from companies that are not falling to the low plus. Home Depot, so far, is one of those companies. So here's what we're doing. I encourage you to do the same. I'm going to go in there, I'm going to buy some stuff, and then I'm going to leave. All right, as you can see, I just went shopping at Home Depot. You should do the same. This wood, this board, this magnificent pop. Dude, I'm. Oh, fucking own, dude. I, oh, I'm so triggered. Why would he buy a single plank from home? Yeah, like he's a multimillionaire and he buys a single piece of wood just for your little publicity stunt. Like, he couldn't have gone in a little bit harder or anything. That's just posturing. That's what it always is. Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically his brand is, is posturing and uh, not really having much substance to it. Home Depot, I'm so mad right now! <laughs> He's so fucking stupid, dude. Oh, the context is so much worse, dude. I would like to buy a single wood, and I would like it to be bagged, please. He didn't buy any tools because he's too beta to know how to use them. So, the thing I always find to be really funny about this is the way conservatives operate, right? Like, they make it seem we'll like they're these, like, super hyper macho masculine people. So, what, uh, Sable Lord Barra, oh man, that's quite the mouthful of a name you have there. Saba Loro Balo says, what is your opinion on the vape male ban? I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, do you want to give me some context on that? Because I haven't heard of any sort of a vape male ban. Is this, can't mail vape materials or you can't put vape materials through the mail? What's, what's the deal with that? I don't really know. We'll continue on as we wait for a reply. Figures who like know how to work with their fucking hands and that's how you're a real man, damn it. It's like, dude, you don't abide by the same standards that you are unnecessarily applying to masculinity. You have every opportunity to just be like, yeah, this shit's silly. Like, you know, some people know how to use their hands. Some people don't, whatever. It's like a fucking hobby. Who cares? Luckily, because division of labor, we don't need to know all this stuff. I just don't, I can't understand why Ben and people like Ben will be like, aha, uh -huh, you're a beta male if you don't know how to work with your hands. But like, you don't know how to work with your hands. You were born into a musician's family in Los Angeles. You learn how to play the the fucking violin when you were like five years old and you've lived in LA your entire life and you've tried to join the Hollywood crew and failed spectacularly at it. Then you went to some of the most elite institutions with the UCLA and then you went to Harvard Law. Why are you creating this unnecessary image about like masculinity and Republican malehood that uh, you yourself do not subscribe to? <laughs> One would please. <laughs> Just found out that Dan Crenshaw is the same size as Ben Shabibo and I'm losing my mind. Oh yeah, no, he is. He's a little, he's a, he's a little, fun little nugget, dude. He's nugget size. Why people need to be stopped? What? Call the there. Then you have Vera Sherbert here. Yeah, do okay. it. Just pop that oh, in. Yeah. We're probably not going to watch this part of the video. They're, they're mixing Sherbert cocktail in the toilet, and it's just really gross. So, I think we'll probably move on from there. Uh, any videos you want to look at next? Do you want to look at the... Have you Shapiro one next? Or? Sure. Okay. Well, we'll we'll find out why Abby uh, Shapiro, Ben's Ben's sister, made the brave step to come out as a conservative. We'll come along. Hello, with beautiful with ladies, and welcome to today's video, where we're going to be talking about why I decided to come out as a conservative influencer. So, in my last couple of videos, you'll have seen that I have come out as a conservative influencer. And I thought I would talk to you guys a little bit about why I decided to do that, because I know that there aren't a lot of influencers in this space who talk about their politics openly. They definitely live a certain lifestyle, but they don't just embrace and say what they actually believe and what their views really are. But it was really important to me that I actually come out and say straight out, I'm conservative. 
The reason I felt this was so important was because I have been afraid to say outright that I am a conservative for a lot of different reasons. The first is that I am an artist, I'm an opera singer, and in an artistic space, it's very difficult to express that you're conservative without A, being afraid that you'll lose jobs, or B, being afraid that you'll lose friends. A lot of the time in artistic spaces, I've found that people who are on the other side of the aisle feel totally comfortable sharing their liberal views, which, hey, if you want to share your views, that's totally fine, but no one on the other side of the aisle could respond. That to me is the real problem. I think that the best conversations and the most fruitful ones are the ones where people are able to say what they think without being afraid that they'll really upset someone. Alexis, when have conservatives ever been shy about sharing their beliefs? Like Never. A, yeah, like there's a guy that I passed on, on my way to work many days. He had like the double American flags blazing. He has like, you know, all the Punisher and the don't tread on me stuff in the back of his, his truck and everything. And he makes sure that everyone sees his pumped up truck as he, as he blazes, you know, weaving in and out of traffic and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's like the, that may be the extreme, but like, I don't think, I don't think I've ever met a conservative who's like, oh, oh I better not share that, that, that that's what I believe on, on any given issue. I mean, have you? I mean, being as though I was an art major in college, I definitely could see where maybe she would feel nervous, maybe, to mention being conservative. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone would care. Yeah. Like, really care, go out of their way to make her life more difficult. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's hard to imagine her life being all that much easier. I mean, look at the, what she's had built up around her. Mm-hmm. You know, all the, all the millions have been pumped into getting views for her channel by advertising to people that don't even watch anything like what she puts out. Well, and she's Ben Shapiro's sister, so she's yeah. got a lot of pull. Yeah, it's just like they they just love playing the victim on on these things and being like, Oh it's it's like the new I don't even know what like um identity that I have to come out as. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure everyone knew ahead of time what her political leanings were because of her family and they like, probably knew her family before her. She literally looks like Ben, but with long hair. Yeah, I know. I, people this... say that all the time. They, they look exactly the same, just one has longer hair, but I don't know, very strange to me. Of course, that doesn't mean you can just be willy-nilly and say things that are insensitive or rude, but really more to the point of, let's talk about our ideas, and if our ideas are different, that's okay, maybe that's even a good thing. It was a positive. I mean, it sounds like kind of a liberal I- ideology to me, let's talk about ideas, and it's okay to have differences of opinion and stuff. It's funny, because it's not actually okay. Like with her? No. Yeah. She's gotten pretty uppity about her like abortion stance and things like that. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of the right ideology conflicts with itself. Oh yeah. Well, and they they're always like you know, we just, we just want to discuss in the marketplace of ideas because you know they love to to. Uh, play up market so much but then when it comes down to it there's only a very narrow path of what they find acceptable and what they're going to call out if it doesn't fit in that narrow path Mm -hmm. and that's religious you know um, modest whatever that means like i mean obviously that means something different to abby than it does to any other conservative uh commentator of any kind Mm -hmm. on traditional values and again it's just these, traditional these very too. amorphous things that yeah often contradict each other and it's funny because they're like oh freedom's such a wonderful thing and like i'm so grateful to be in a free country but i only like it when you guys act the way that i do yeah yeah you're free you're free to be like me mm-hmm. don't you get it you're free to be conservative or you're free to be wrong and then you'll be shunned right and that's basically That's basically the binary that they they operate in. Mm -hmm. A really big lesson for me when I was at the Manhattan School of Music, because I was there for three years, and it wasn't until I came out and said that I was conservative that I found out that there were actually more of us than I thought. But we had all kept it secret because we were all afraid of expressing that we actually had 
a differing viewpoint. I think it's really important for conservative women to have a space to be open and honest about what they believe. For so- I mean, that's absolutely true for anyone to have a space to converse with other individuals. You know, what, 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 what would you call that, that sort of a space? Well, you know, a place where it's, it's non-threatening, you don't have to worry about things, your guard is let down. What, what kind of a space would you, would you call that? Your house. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was trying to lead you to more. Oh, okay. So you knew what I was saying. I see. I see. I see how it is. Do you want do you want to finish the thought then or, or shall I? Okay, yeah, okay. So I I would call that a safe space. Would you would you not? Sure. Yeah, sure. Sure she says. Yeah, yeah, if only conservatives had more safe spaces, then, then you know, they wouldn't have to be subject to the harsh world that's just gonna blast them for clinging to tradition. I feel like the biggest problem with them is it's like they can't argue on their own behalf very well because everything clashes with everything else that they believe in. Yeah. It's like the English language. This rule applies until it doesn't. Right. Like, abortions are bad, but the death penalty is great. Well, okay. Yeah, for <laughs> like sure. Like, how, what's the difference? Well, I, I, th- I think what it really comes down to is, is they're a lot more conservative than society and they don't want to admit that. You, you know, they know that, that things like free speech and, and freedom of religion are, are popular, and they will they will claim to, to think the same thing, but they don't really believe in freedom of religion or freedom of speech. They want everyone to, you know, uh, you know, especially people like, like Abby, they want people to, to, to have freedom of religion as long as it's, you know, a Judeo-Christian, like, you know, and in fact, if you get into all the, the books, of, or the, all the abrahamic religions that include except for islam. islam yeah yeah some somehow the the newer one is 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 just right up even though it originated from the same place they all come from the middle east like you know basically within a few hundred miles of each other but somehow that one's the that one's the one that we don't talk about but as long as it's judeo or christian well then you should have all the freedom of religion and, and free speech and, and and all that good stuff so and another thing I think is really interesting on that topic, she talks about modesty often in her videos. Mm-hmm. But then they're so anti-Muslim. And like, how much more modest can you get than a woman in an abaya and a hijab? Yeah, well, really. I mean, that, that's the entire purpose of it. And all, right. those, all those same religions, in fact, a lot of religions, whether like Hindi, um, I believe the Sikh, at least with with the the head coverings and stuff like that. A lot of religions have some form of, of dress like that. You look mm-hmm. at the, the Catholic nuns; it doesn't look that much different than a, than a right. hijab. Um, you you look. I mean, she's not even wearing uh, traditional uh, Jewish garb, or else her head her hair would be covered. It's it's considered sinful to go out and and be seen in public with your head uncovered. So she's not even following her own rules. Of, of modesty. She's not even, the, you know, the, the picture of modesty within the Jewish religion. In fact, she wouldn't be appearing at all if she was in the, the very orthodox uh, branches of, of Judaism because it's, it's considered immodest for women to even be seen in public, unless, unless the man be aroused. I mean, mm-hmm. doesn't that sound familiar? That's a whole other box of things. So, yeah, it's, it, all, the, all their views are very arbitrary and, and they, they clash because they don't want to admit that you know what they really want is, is some sort of a theocracy basically they want uh, a king or, or, or a queen uh, but more likely a king to, to just rule over them and, and lay down the, the theocratic laws and have everyone they think everyone will be better off if they're just forced to to conform to their religion basically so mm-hmm. yeah maybe not so open-minded about the marketplace of ideas after all so long it's felt like conservative women have really had to keep all of their thoughts under wraps so that they don't get in trouble from their bosses their friends or their teachers part of me kind of sees a flake of truth in what she's saying as a conservative woman i'm sure she's silenced more in her community because i think i hear a lot from conservative men Mm -hmm. 
And they definitely have a voice. Okay, well, I mean, first of all, do you think that Abby Shapiro has ever had an actual job with a boss? No. <laughs> of course not. I mean, that kind of undermines her point a little bit about, hey, fellow worker, you know how it is when you go up to the boss and you t- say your conservative stuff? And, yeah. Like, I've, I mean, if anything, I, I think the opposite is true. If, if you say anything, maybe, I mean, you know, having a video to talk about, like, union organizing or, or mm-hmm. any sort of uh, ideology that goes against capitalism, well, that's actually grounds for firing in a lot of places. Um, legal or not, they, they'll they'll find a way. They'll to do find it. a way to get yeah. you out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, just put it under the guise of something else. And I, and I think most workplaces, they just kind of they try to tamp down any sort of political talk or, or that sort of thing because they they don't want their workers to to have controversy. They just want them to you know get the product out the door or the service out the door. I mean, right. They just they want a frictionless environment where where people are just you know cogs in their machine to to do their, their, their bidding, basically. So, yeah, but let, let's hear some more about how, how tough it is to be conservative at work. And I think conservative women, in some ways, have it harder than conservative men. If you don't believe that women should have a choice when it comes to abortion, a lot of women will say that you're insensitive. Well, I would say that we're not insensitive. We care about the child, the baby. And conservative women are very often not taken seriously. Well, One of the things I found fascinating is that conservative that women second. can't even find a community when they want. All right. Okay. What do we have here? So, Mirage Leonard eighty four uh, Leonardo, excuse me, eighty four, says on Facebook they would they screenshot everything she posts for clout. Mm, not quite sure what you're referring to there. Uh, but Facebook has been a dumpster fire since the dawn of time. Well, yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you there. Facebook, Twitter, all the all these these areas where people tend to pile on one another. Yeah, not not exactly the the place for <laughs> good faith discussion. Eisenhower, 1953. Hi, I'm a Republican. Why are you guys on the left? The left does not support capitalism. The Zen, uh, capitalism is the key to a great society. I would totally disagree with that. Uh, thank you for following, though. I do appreciate that. Well, um, let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I would say that capitalism, and and here's how I'm going to define it, and you can, I'll have you give your definition, too. But how I, how I look at capitalism, more than anything, uh, Richard Wolff brought up a pretty good definition in his recent debate with Destiny. And he said that capitalism is basically the relationship of employer and employee. So you have the, the employer who owns whatever means of production there is, um, and they basically hold all the cards, and uh, the employee is free to either accept a contract to work for them or to find another employer. Uh, that, that's, to me, that's an inherently unfair scenario. I mean, for one thing, the employer is always going to have the, the biggest compensation because they can. They're at the top. They, they, they set all the rules. It's basically uh, a form of authoritarianism that we except just because it's in the workplace. Um, so I, I think that a, a more uh, fair and egalitarian system is better for society, like uh, where you have, you, know, you, you get rid of the employer-employee relationship, except for maybe in some, you know, uh, very specific circumstances, like a mom-and-pop shop, you know, not talking about getting rid of a mom-and-pop shop or like having... Your, your, your children work for you if you own a small business or something like that. But for anything more than, say, like five or ten employees, you should be forced to, to have it uh, more of a, a cooperative where there are no more employer-employees relationships. Everyone is the employer. Everyone is the owner collectively and, and decisions about things like compensation and um, workplace environment and, you know, the, the big stuff that... that that matter to you as, as an employee. Uh, the employer has a more important job. I disagree. I think in, in most circumstances, pretty much anyone can can take on the same role as, as the employer does uh, and should be paid a lot more. Yeah, I disagree. Um, and, and again, whether or not that's the case, be, just because of the, the structure, you are um, 
you're making things in a sort of pyramidal system. So some people can get ahead by being an employer, but not everybody can. You know, there always has to you always have to have then employees in order to be an employer. You always have to have more employees uh, in order to get that higher compensation than anyone else. So I would disagree with that. But before I go too far, what, what would you say your de definition of capitalism is? I feel like it's kind of harsh, but I think capitalism is kind of the ultimate pyramid scheme. Yeah. Like who's ever at the very, very top has all the control, has all the money, and it's just kind of a game about who can we exploit the most. And what's funny is that I feel like over time that like employee loyalty means nothing. Like oh, for sure. they, you can work for the same employer for like 10 years mm -hmm. and really not see much of a raise. And it's funny that these employers don't care because every single time you have to replace an employee, the HR costs and everything else is like $1,500 every time. Mm -hmm. And to me, that would be really expensive over time. And I'd much rather have employees that are loyal to me and the company. And like, we all work together right. to make things better. Mm -hmm. And another thing that really bothers me in this system is like the minimum wage hasn't gone up in over 10 years. The minimum wage is not a livable wage in this country. Right. There is no reason anyone should have a full-time job and not be able to sustain themselves on one full-time job. Right. That's unacceptable. That's absolutely unacceptable because what that's saying is that this job has to be done. You know, we, we need this sort of a worker to do this sort of a thing, but we're not willing to even pay you enough to, to live. Like, that's just inhumane by, by any sense of the word. You have to at least compensate people enough to live on. Otherwise, I mean, you're gonna, I mean, otherwise they have to get more than one job for one thing to make ends meet, which means they're grinding themselves down even harder. Um, and it's, uh, that doesn't sound very free to me. You keep talking about how capitalism equals freedom and markets turn on wages. We're not even talking about markets at all when we're talking about the, the employment relationship. In a worker-owned cooperative, there are still markets. They still participate in the marketplace. marketplace. They just make these certain decisions together. And that's not to say that there aren't still managers you need to separate the term manager from the term uh, employer because they're often different things. I mean, at, at my job, for, for instance, my, my, the owner of my company, I have met him once in the, the seven or eight months that I've worked there. Amazon can pay its workers $50 an hour. A small business cannot pay their workers $15 an hour without inflating their prices. Sounds like they need to inflate their prices. I mean, it sounds like they shouldn't be in business if they can't afford to pay a living wage. Would, would you have these people starve? Is, is that the solution, just to, to save the, the poor small business owner? Can I ask a question? So you wrote in the chat, capitalism equals freedom. Freedom for who? Yeah, basically freedom for, that's a good question. I really enjoy that you're on here and like adding to this because I think this should be a conversation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to me, I mean, to, to kind of start answering that question, I, I would say that it's freedom for the employer and the employer around. Freedom equals choice. Okay. For there to be a choice, like a meaningful choice for, for all, sure. Don't you have to have a meaningful alternative? If you are if you're at an entry level job, your alternative is to go to a different entry level job. If you're at a job that pays minimum wage or at least under a livable wage, your quote unquote choice is then to go to a different job that has the same conditions, which which to a certain degree, your employer is delighted to see because the more employee churn there is, even though it's costing them money in the short term to, to rehire it may end up saving them money because then people are never around long enough to really feel that they're, they're you know, adding enough value to demand more. Uh, people not getting an annual raise. That's market competition. Okay, but see, you're going all over the place, dude. Uh, first you say freedom equals choice, and now you're saying that's market competition. 
cool, that doesn't give you more choice. Competition doesn't mean choice. I mean, if it did, we wouldn't have to have a minimum wage. But before we had a minimum wage, people worked for, I mean, they were kind of, employees would constantly, or potential employees would constantly undercut each other to, to pay, get paid less and less because they were so, uh, you know, desperate to have a job. Raising wages to $15 would just make unemployment skyrocket. Hard mm-hmm. disagree. That's never happened. Choose where you work. Again, you have to have a meaningful alternative for there to be a real choice, right? So just choosing one master over another, you're still working for a master. So I think a good example might be, okay, so let's say you work at McDonald's. You work there full time. Because that place is open 24-7 and pays you probably seven seventy five. Let's say you get minimum wage. How on earth do you pay your rent for a one bedroom apartment and get a vehicle to get to work or pay for your bus pass? I mean, your rent alone is going to crush you. Right. And then being able to get a second job that'll work around those hours because whatever your full time job is, they're going to expect 100% loyalty and flexibility. Like, this is your full time job, this is your primary job. Anything else, you're just going to have to work around the side. So then maybe you lose that second job. Mm-hmm. And then there goes your ability to pay rent. Yeah. Or, so or, that's where I'm coming from. Or your two different jobs have conflicting schedules because you work in the, the food service industry or something like that. And the schedules rotate around and, and, you know, they end up clashing and neither of your bosses is uh, willing to, to cut you any slack on that. So you end up losing one of those jobs. You want to see the chat? Uh, small business won't be able to afford to pay their workers. Uh, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's just not borne out. You, you can't just, you can just, I mean, you can just say those things, but that's not backed up. Every time they've raised minimum wage, somehow small businesses have continued to survive. So again, you can't afford, if you really can't afford to pay minimum wage, uh, then you can't really afford to be in business. So. I mean, really, fifteen dollars—that was that was the basic livable wage a decade ago. But it's been so long that uh, minimum wage has been stagnant that that's that we've even passed that point. So fifteen dollars is really the minimum that it needs to. And you say that that uh, Nebraska doesn't need to raise it to fifteen. There's no place in Nebraska either where you can afford to live and and, and get paid fifteen dollars an hour. It's just not going to happen. I mean, <laughs> Eisenhower, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that you've seen all of these talking points before and, you, and you're just going to regurgitate them one after another, but you're not exactly making a coherent argument. You're just kind of pivoting from one thing to another every time I bring up a problem with the thing you say. So if you can't afford your house, it ain't my problem. Well, the thing is, everyone should be able to have a place to live. Do you, do you think there should be homeless people? Is that is that a, is that a free society when there's homeless people? How free are they? You know, how free are they from from uh, being bothered by anyone who comes along? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you can't. You either want freedom for everybody, which means you got to kind of support them in some way or another, or you want freedom for the people that already have the power. Should raise it on the state level, not the federal? Okay, but I mean, the reason they have to do it at the federal level is because the states are lagging behind. It's just too bad. I mean, you can look at the, the data. There's no place in America where you can afford to live on a single minimum wage uh, job. There's no place where you can afford to rent a one-bedroom apartment on minimum on a single minimum wage job. If you think that's somehow freedom or that's somehow good for, for anybody, then I think you need to re-examine your assumptions here. I should not pay for someone else's house. So you'd rather them be out on the street. So Hang on. Should not pay for someone else's house through taxes. Well, the funny thing is, there's enough housing out there for everyone. Good there's plenty too. of abandoned spaces that people who don't currently have places to live could live in. And also, the taxes you pay go to help the entire community. So you pay taxes, you should be the only one on the road. Because you paid taxes for that road, yeah. or the people 
who take the bus to work, they shouldn't be allowed to use that road. Because if they haven't paid taxes on it, they can't use it. Yeah, and, and, and here's another angle for you. In, in cities such as Denver, where they have decided to just give housing, just give, I should say, housing to the homeless, no strings attached, no requirement to meet this or that, they have had a, a more than a, a drop in the social services needed to give to those same homeless people that is more than, than they had to pay for that housing. And the people have better mental health outcomes Okay, gotta go now, but have a good day. Bye. Cool. It was interesting to hear your opinion. I, I, I appreciate you at least listening to the opinion. Hope to see you back on the stream soon. I stream every Sunday uh, and Friday around 7 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Friday is more for theory. It's, it's less of a back and forth. This is, this is my casual day on Sundays. So yeah, hope to see you again there. Thanks for uh, at least giving your opinion. All right. Well, I think we're going to, unless you had something more to add to that, I think we'll probably move back to the video. I was curious to what, you know about their healthcare opinion, but they're gone now, so. That's okay. That tends to be how these things go, especially when you're on the politics stream. You get a, a nice random assortment of people, which I kind of like, you know. You never know what you're going to get. And, uh, you know, there's always someone who's interested in, in these sorts of things, even if they're coming from a different uh, perspective. Anyway, shall we move on? All right. We got another comment in the chat, though. Oh, okay. We should really allow the states to decide their wages. Every state is different. I understand that. You know, and definitely it's a blunt instrument to use the federal uh, minimum wage. But again, if the states aren't keeping up, what else can you really do? Like mm -hmm. at, at some point, you got to say that the people's welfare and, and, and well-being is more important than some vague notion of, of states' rights or state autonomy. Like if they're if they're falling down on their end of the bargain, what else can you do, really? Right, and that's the point we're pushed. at. Because I mean, like, I do think he has a good point there. Because you think about like a fifteen dollar minimum wage in New York, that's going to do nothing. Right. But if it's in Iowa, that could really help a lot of people. Right. The so, problem is there's just there's just no catch all right, way to slow. do everything, and and yeah, if the states are lagging behind, which they are, the entire country is lagging behind, but but mm -hmm. especially individual states that you know haven't haven't hiked it in i mean even the state that we're in minnesota right now is it's an abysmal minimum wage i make probably three uh, just about three times the minimum wage and i live comfortably i, I i'm by by no means <laughs> wealthy i wouldn't even call myself middle class but i do okay but that's that's three times the, the minimum wage i can't imagine I, I mean i wouldn't be able to live on a minimum wage job i would have to have two to three jobs cobbled together at 20 hours each, uh, you know, and, and that would be me being gone, you know, 60 hours plus a week just to, to make ends meet. Like, uh, you know, as Eisenhower was uh, advocating for freedom, I don't see much freedom in that. And there's a lot of people like that, you know? So, yeah. Well, let's move on with the video. I don't mind straying off track at all. This is a very casual day. So we're just kind of reacting to, to videos and stuff like that. So anything goes really, I mean, not anything. Don't, don't get belligerent, but <laughs> anything within really reason goes. And we'll say that. Too, because no one feels comfortable voicing their views. So that's why I decided to come out and say I was conservative. I don't like living in fear. I don't like making choices based on being afraid. So instead, I wanted to come out and say, yes, I Thanks am a conservative. Why does it matter that I'm conservative if I'm an influencer? Well, my conservative views come prior to everything else. Everything that I talk about, everything that I believe in, everything that I choose to wear, or even the makeup that I put on, it comes from a conservative and classic perspective. When I say let's be classic, to me, that's a lifestyle. And for me, that classic lifestyle is built on my conservative lifestyle. My goal for Classically Abby isn't for it to be an only conservative woman space, but a place where conservative women feel comfortable voicing their views. So if you find that you're on the opposite side of the aisle or even just a moderate, I would love to have you here if you are open to the idea of having conversations and discussions with people on the other side. That to me is an exciting opportunity that we have here. A place. Have you ever heard Abby have a conversation with anyone who disagrees with her? No. <laughs> I, 
I can't say that I have either. I don't. I think she's ill-equipped for it. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, she seems positively petrified of, of anyone who's actually on the left. Mm-hmm. It seems like she only likes liberals in, in the idea that she can kind of convert them over to her side so that they can together push against. The funny thing is, if you ever scroll through the chats, any like people who have opinions different than her are clearly liberal or leftist. Mm-hmm. She doesn't respond to those. Yeah. She yeah. just ignores them. She makes this big posture about, about how open she is to discussion and how she's just like, she just wants to, you know, she's just asking questions. It's like that old trope. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just asking questions. I'm just bringing things up. I would totally go. Mm-hmm. I would totally. Oh, yeah. I would definitely talk to her in a heartbeat. I, I, I don't think it would be a productive discussion at all. And she'd probably just hang up or find some reason to leave pretty early on. But I would definitely, I would definitely take that opportunity for sure. One hundred percent. Not that I'm ever going to be a big enough streamer to to be on her radar. You never know. You never know. You know, only only way to go is up. So <laughs> the other thing that that I was kind of noticing though, um, she never really just. I mean, she calls her channel classically Abby, but I don't think I've ever really heard her define what what exactly that means. I mean, she's kind of vaguely gestured at it, like covering Try your boobs. Dress modestly. But I mean, again, that's like, you know, is she dressing modestly? She's got a she's got a very low cut V neck shirt. To a lot of people, I mean, she probably prayed about it before she. <laughs> oh, okay. So she's getting divine inspiration. Well, I mean, still, she's not letting us in on that that divine commandments of what constitutes modesty. That's a private conversation. <laughs> well, again, like you'd think if your your channel has like. It'd be like, you know, I have, I have bread theory uh, in, in my title. If I never talked about, well, I mean, I, it, it's bread in, in terms of the conquest of bread and that sort of thing. That's where I get it from. Which well, we actually, talk about money a lot, so. But I, I talk bread. about that every week. And if I never talked about theory, but I'm just like, you need to be more theoretical. You need to read theory and stuff like that. At some point, you'd think someone would ask, like, hey, what do you mean by theory? What, what theory should I be reading or something like that? It's just kind of weird, like to, to style yourself this way, and then I don't know, never really get to that part of it. Like I don't know. It's just one of those situations where you just keep talking, and if you keep talking enough, like you'll forget that you had anything to say. It's like hypnosis with words. I know you, Marky, right? <laughs> she does it's look ben spot Shapiro on, like with long hair. Like Ben Shapiro. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for hanging out for a little bit, Yo Marky. I hope to see you again in a future stream. Thanks for keeping it at least civil. I do appreciate that. We don't have to agree. That, that's definitely not a requirement on this channel, as long as we can uh, not not devolve into chuttery. We'll just put it that way. So, yeah. Thanks for hanging out. Hope to see you again. Once again, uh, seven o'clock Central Standard Time on Sundays and Fridays. So let's uh, let's continue on in the video. Let's see what other pearls of wisdom Ben and Wade has to say. Women from know. all different sides right. and all different viewpoints really have a space to converse without being afraid that you're going to lose a friendship. With all of that in mind, I did create a locals community like, so okay, that we could have. If you lose a have... friendship over a political opinion, did you really have a solid friendship to begin with? Well, like what what was the opinion? Is it like? <laughs> I think these people's lives don't matter. I mean, because that's not really an opinion. Like, that that becomes just a, a statement of ideology. <laughs> I mean, there's something that goes beyond just a casual difference of opinions. Like, an right. opinion is like, I think that the, the marginal tax rate should be 20% and, and you think it should be 5% because of this, that. I mean, that's an opinion. Like, if you lost a friendship over that, okay, that's, that's kind of petty. But, like... What kind of a... <laughs> that's a great place we froze that at, by the way. <laughs> She's going to drop some knowledge on us. Guys, I really appreciate it if you take me seriously. <laughs> Fuck that. This is really hard to come out like this. I know. Yeah, it's been it's been so hard from her for her to be astroturfed into a, a channel. Let's see how many followers she has at this point. She ha- oh, she only has 92,000 subs? Like, all that? I mean, they must have spent, like, a million dollars. Like, YouTube ads to, like, put, put in, like, advertisements before videos <laughs> and stuff. That's not cheap. No. 
I mean, of course, it's probably not her money at all. I'm sure she's got backers from mommy, daddy. Well, well mommy, daddy, probably her brother, probably her husband's other, other lawyer. Rich. So well, I'm yeah, sure they're sitting I mean, pretty. They're connected in this way and that, but still, I mean, that's 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 sad. She hasn't even broken a hundred thousand yet. Like I don't know. Maybe maybe there's not hope in the world for classical people after all. Too. Like I mean, I wonder how many of those people that watch it just watch it like we do, too. Yeah. Like I would guess about half at least. Like I mean, probably. You can probably tell from the comments. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not going to be able to read most of these sorts of things. <laughs> yup. Uh. Yup. <laughs> I love it. Well, I love I'm so just going to keep scrolling till I find a, a positive comment. Ad randomly showed up. <laughs> These are all just disses on her, and and people saying, "Why did this ad show up in my feed? I don't want. I don't know anything about this lady." <laughs> More dislikes and subscribers. Does it really? I wonder if that's still true. Yeah. It has one hundred one thousand dislikes, and she has ninety two thousand subscribers, and only twenty one. So okay. So there you go. That's your ratio there. See, twenty one thousand likes, and she she puts out videos seldom enough that I'm sure most of the people that actually like her actually take the time to, to thumbs up it and stuff. That's just sad, man. Like one only one out of five of of your subscribers actually like your content, and like and that makes it even more pitiful. That's like. Oh, I'm so bad at doing math on the fly, but if you if you spend a million dollars to only so get, one eighth. You're the math whiz here. <laughs> if I spend a million dollars and I only get twenty thousand uh, likes for my video, how how many dollars per like is that? Hang on. I don't know. I'm just I hate doing math, and especially hate doing. Hang on. I'm pressure. double checking. <laughs> double checking. How many likes did you say? She's got, she's got twenty thousand likes. Divided by twenty thousand. Say five thousand? Fifty. That's like fifty dollars a like. That's pitiful. Also, That's can pitiful. we just okay. Should we talk about likes and those being pitiful in the first place? Like period. Yeah. Because think about it like Facebook culture and like people post things for likes and like that validates them for like five seconds and then that feeling goes away. Yeah. And people become so incredibly codependent on that to the point where they will pay for them. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to do that one. Like, ouch. I know. Like, that would be a huge hit to my pride. Like, I'm. But then that's the problem with capitalism. There's a monetary value on everything. Right. Like, that. that's basically what YouTube and Facebook and all these things do is they monetize mm -hmm. attention. So, which is, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a gross factor to it, especially if you can buy your way into more attention. Right. And go thank goodness Twitch has not gone that route yet. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. There's no, you can't just throw a bunch of money at it and get a whole bunch of subscribers. Because and, and, mm -hmm. you can't advertise across channels, I guess. Mm -hmm. I certainly have never seen an ad for another. Well, I saw an ad for one channel, but that was kind of, that was for another company. And it was some lady who has, like... 10,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that's the only advertisement for another, that's the only advertisement for any Twitch channel I've ever seen anywhere. So hopefully it'll stay that way, but you know, that dollar bill has always got, got its uh, claws into more and more. Mm -hmm. So it's probably only a matter of time before Twitch gets big enough and mm -hmm. they start making it harder for the little guy. Stuff like that. No, they won't. Yeah. Well, I mean, I hope not. They do great so far. Videos. They do need more plant videos. Like like your amazing plant videos. But yeah. All right. Well, let's go back to. Yeah, let's wrap it up and move on to uh, let's someone move else. Move on to the next one. As as lovely. I think I'm gonna frame this this picture here. I'm just gonna put over my wall. Be like, hang in there, thick. That space built in. I want to have some sort of filter so that people who don't share these views of openness and open conversation can't just come in and flood the comments. I want this to be a space that really is safe. 
What I'm hoping to do is that for those who have a Patreon will have private live streams that will encourage us to have a conversation where I'll be there and you can comment in and I'll respond to questions and comments and you guys can talk to each other there as well. And another thing I'm really interested in looking into is doing video chat calls with my premium subscribers where we can have a group chat, 25 people, 50 people, however many people where we're really oh, talking about old, these man. ideas and we can actually talk to each other face to face. This whole thing makes me true. so excited. And it's been a goal of mine that's, that's been in the works for a long people. time. I really oh, love I the idea because that you imagine, conservative like entire, women and women across the aisle would all I feel comfortable just, like, sharing their views and talking things. about these <laughs> ideas you without say, I love you, Abby. And that is why else. I decided to come out as a conservative influencer. Please let me know in the comments below what you think about all this. If you are a conservative woman that has been silenced and hasn't talked about your views, I would love to hear how you feel about this. And I'd love to know how you'd like to be a part of this community. What other stuff you think a premium subscriber should have? I would love to know. And if you are on the other side of the aisle, please continue to comment. I love to hear your guys' points of view, especially with respect to Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. Please subscribe to my channel and watch. All right, that's about enough of hey, that. Hey, cuties, it's yeah, me. Let's move on to Thoughts Line, someone I actually like a whole lot. And he's going to talk about how infinite growth is actually bad. Who would have thought? Because it's a Ponzi scheme? Well, because it's just, it's impossible. We live on a finite planet. Like, the only thing that keeps coming in is sunshine. Hey, mind fits. And even that's you like that burn noise? Out? The noise well, is sure. in the background the is construction that's been going on for a week, nonstop. The Grey Goo is the name for a hypothetical end-of-the-world scenario first described by Kim Eric Drexler in his book, The Engines of Creation. The book was about imagining how nanotechnology, which if you're not familiar, is essentially just microscopic autonomous machines, and how that might change the way we live. The Grey Goo is a potential danger of that technology going berserk. Here's how it goes. You got a little nano machine. It's programmed to make more nano machines just like itself. Now, say for whatever reason, yeah, human error, malfunction, delivered mouse, before, doesn't matter, the, the machine is told to manufacture robots. more and more copies of itself with no limit. Each machine it makes, makes more copies of itself, pulling in more and more matter until all matter on Earth is a uniform mass of these tiny machines. A gray goo. Nano machines suck. You can probably turn it down. Now, here on Hypertext Transfer Protocol, secure colon slash slash youtube.com slash thought slime, we're very pro goo. But even I must admit this is a frightening scenario. Not a likely one, you know, as, as even Drexler points out, but still, you can imagine it. And while I have my misgivings about the likelihood of such a science fiction scenario playing out in the real world, I think the gray goo scenario makes a pretty good analogy for capitalism's death drive towards infant growth. When exactly do you think capital will be done making money? How much money is enough for the handful of ultra-rich jackasses who have most of it already? If there were an answer to that question, we long ago sailed past it, because several of them own incalculable sums, so much that they could not spend it in a thousand lifetimes, and yet, they don't stop. Despite the consequences, the human cost, the environmental cost, they keep going. It's not enough to simply have money, they have to earn more and more and more. The biggest businesses don't measure success in terms of profits anymore. I just got to really, I mean, that's something that in the short term, capitalism has going for it because it, it's exponential. It has to keep growing and growing and growing. Um, and that's good if you're, you know, sucking up more and more of that money. The problem is eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> to quote Margaret Thatcher. It's trouble with dribbles. Yeah, basically. Yeah, it's just it, at some point you run out of, of places to go and, and new countries to exploit, and, and then you're suffocated by tribbles. And then and then you're inevitably suffocated by cute furry things that, that look like Furbies without a face. So let that be a lesson to you. If you make a million dollars one year and then a million dollars the next year, you've stalled out. If you make two million dollars one year and then one million the next, your business is failing, even though you made. I just thought of something. Sure. So you know how they are always like, it's going to trickle down, right? Yeah. Eventually, these wealthy people are going to put more money back into the little guy. Right. And they don't. Okay. So then, little guy, 
doesn't make a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Probably has to work a couple jobs to make ends meet. Odds are really good the little guy isn't going to procreate. Mm -hmm. So then the birth numbers drop. Then that means that the big guys don't have enough little guys to exploit. Yeah. And then it all collapses in on itself. Yeah, I guess that that, that, that does make sense in theory. I, I mean... I mean, this is obviously be over a long time, right? Sure. But I'm just well, thinking think in, in that term. Right. I think in practice, I mean, the, the, the lowest, the lower classes of people do always have a, just a higher birth rate because, you know, if you're going to send your kids to college and stuff, it ends up being expensive, which is why when countries um, industrialize, you know, get, get bigger, get more wealthy, they tend to see uh, a drop in birth rate then because, you know, you got a lot more decisions to make. It's You, you can't just send your kids all out the door at 18 and, and, and hope for the best. So, but yeah, I can definitely see what you're saying too, though. Definitely. Yeah, I don't know. Have you ever seen a thought slime video before? Yes, you said... I, you've shown me several. Okay, I wasn't sure. I mean, I. I you guys have the same haircut. Yeah, I guess we kind of do have the same haircut. Although he, he keeps his beard a lot more uh, close crop than I do. I like to have a little mane, though. A little, a little fuzz there. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah. A million dollars, it's time to reevaluate your strategies. Maybe reshape your leadership. Your success no longer about profit, it's about growth. But there's a problem with this model, a problem that's evident to everyone but economists and business people. At some point, however distant, there's an upper limit on how much money you can possibly make. There are only so many resources to be extracted from the earth until there aren't any left. And then there are only so many consumers. So. Right. Building off of what he's saying. Right? Take Jeff Bezos. Yeah. He's like a dragon. <laughs> he has so much money, he'd never go bankrupt. I mean, he, could, he probably he, couldn't if he tried. He'd have to take all But you really have companies. to work at it, yeah, you really have to work at it. Like, like if, it would have to be something thought out and super proactive yeah. before that would even hit. Yeah. Like, why is it necessary for someone like that to have so much wealth? And there's other people that are walking down the street with absolutely nothing. Well, yeah. Yeah. There's no need. Absolutely no need. In fact, I mean, I, I always wonder about millionaires and billionaires. Because, like, if I had that much money, like, to the point where I literally couldn't give it away, I would spend a good portion of each day just giving it away to whoever I saw. Like, go to a coffee shop, just pff, toss a pile of cash at them. You see a, a guy mm -hmm. in the, the street corner, pff, a pile of cash. Right. I mean, that'd be fun. Like, that'd be awesome to see people's faces light up and like. But they never do that. In fact, they like the opposite. They're like, you know, right. mm, you're not getting my money. Or, or you know, I have. Oh, ten percent very... tip is generous enough. Right. You know these these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. well, I was thinking, oh, I have a very calculated amount that I need to donate before the end of the year so I can write yeah, it off on my yeah. taxes. Well, I mean that that's a whole another conversation. Like the the charity and, and the foundation industrial complex right. basically just in, in many cases a, a money laundering scheme where you can put your kids on the board they can draw you know uh five or six figure salary just by going to a few board meetings a, a year mm -hmm. you know you you can you can donate to it and then and then you get a, a, a substantial write-off on your taxes it's just a tax dodge in many ways and there's very low requirements about how much of their endowment or, or whatever they have to spend each year. So it just kind of kind of just piles up and piles up and mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily go to do anything. Right. So, but that, yeah, that, that's a whole big conversation too. It's to purchase your products before demand inevitably plummets. But still, you can see why this is a particularly dangerous attitude coming from companies whose products are destructive to extract, manufacture, or consume. It's dangerous for fossil fuel companies to want to extract and sell as much fossil fuel as they can, given the disastrous effect this has on the environment and the limited dwindling fossil fuels available to us. It's dangerous for cigarette companies to want to get as many people hooked on cigarettes as they can, because then all of the teens are going to look so cool that they won't follow rules anymore. And what are principles and deans going to do? And people have difficulty imagining the scope of this problem. We tend to anthropomorphize large businesses as though they're just people that want to get rich and are willing to do anything to do it. 
which would be bad enough. But it's so much worse than that, because they're trying to get money that meaningfully makes no difference to them. They don't seek out some sort of goal where they have enough money to give themselves and the people around them what they want. They get that, and then they keep going, just keep going. forever, no or more realistically, until they can't anymore, until they've used everything up. And at that point, we are doomed. Like the gray goo, there is no shutoff switch. There is no way to say, you've done it, you've made enough. It will single-mindedly continue the process until it physically can't anymore. There is nothing which will make them stop, as evidenced by fossil fuel companies learning their practices were affecting the global climate in potentially apocalyptic ways in the fucking 1970s and choosing to hide that information and just keep going business as usual for 50 years. The prospect of ending life on Earth as we know it was not enough to even get this process to slow down, let alone stop. Hell, we couldn't stop these companies from speeding up. And here's the truly spooky part. Here is the thing that keeps me up at night. I don't think that this is simply a result of human greed anymore. I mean, undoubtedly, that's a factor, especially early in the life of any business. But after a certain point, these corporations become, in effect, autonomous beings with a sort of emergent gestalt will of their own. The corporation is legally required to produce value for its share. I don't think he's wrong. No, I don't think he's wrong either. I mean, think about it. In politics and stuff, they try to treat businesses like they're people. Right, yeah. They but do. they treat the business people better than the actual people that... Yeah. Right, yeah. They, you know, they, they, they can bend over backwards to give huge tax breaks to corporations while, you mm -hmm. know, quibbling about $15 per hour for the minimum wage and stuff like that. Like, it, it doesn't make... I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I know why they do it. It just, on a humanistic scale, on a, in a humanitarian way, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And if, like, you're donating to charity out of a need for a tax break, is that really coming from a good charitable spot? Probably not. No, no. I mean, almost definitely not. You, you were doing it for the prestige. So you can, you know, like mm -hmm. your Bill Gates, you can say, oh, we... We donated so a website. billion dollars to this, that, or the other thing. And like, yeah, good for you. You can, you can pat yourself on the back. You can you can go to a bunch of banquets and rub shoulders with more powerful people. And, and then you can blow all your employees or fire half your employees and drop the wage down. Right. Another thing I want to add to this, too, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of going in a little off topic, so I apologize. Oh, no, that's, that's what this like night's for. That's fine. Mitch McConnell. Uh-huh. And he's always complaining about people or businesses, like, politically affiliating themselves. And it's like, excuse me, how many political do or, uh, donations from large businesses do you accept? Oh, all of them. And, and, and he has all this, this, all these talking points that he, he brings up anytime someone questions him on the amount of campaign donations he's got. He's like... Well, compared to what people spend money on, on my campaign, people spend more money on cornflakes every year. It's like, well, that, okay, you spend money That's on cornflakes, you, you at least get something to eat. You spend money on, on Mitch McConnell, and you're just an average person. What do you get? You get absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. Hot right take. Oh, 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 hot Businesses take, yeah. shouldn't be allowed to donate to political campaigns at all. Yeah. If you're in politics, you are purely funded by human individuals. I, I would I would definitely agree with that. It doesn't make any sense to, to treat money as, as political speech because that just means that the people with the most dollars get to speak the loudest. Mm -hmm. like there's an inherent undemocratic uh, aspect to that. Right. And, and it, supposedly we live in a form of democracy. But I know people love to say, ooh, it's a representative republic. But that's a form of democracy still. That still falls under representative government, which is a, a will of the people. That's what democracy is. It doesn't have to be a pure democracy for it to be a democracy. But but anyway, when when money equals speech, you know, there's all kinds of, of, of things that come into play. Like, is there such thing as a legal bribe anymore? If you can just say, well, I just gave him a lot of money for his campaign, right. and he just happened to give me a sweetheart deal... You know, developing this this huge area and, and yeah, it was just a coincidence. Just a coincidence, and mm -hmm. you know, just a coincidence that we we hire high priced, uh, you know, lobbyists to go and and talk 
as as much as they can, as as often as they can, to politicians uh, to push their own agendas. That's just a coincidental thing. Like, mm-hmm. no, absolutely so not. Why? Money money distorts the the political process. It's, I mean, if if it didn't, there wouldn't be billions upon billions of dollars in political ad revenue every every year, basically at this point. I mean, I think we'd have more of a true left and right because I know a lot of the rest of the world looks at us and says, well, we like, there right is no parties. left in America. Yeah, in in European standards, even in in the places like the UK, which is probably the country that that's most like us in in Europe, that there's still you know. Labor, the Labor Party, which which mm-hmm. would be the closest thing to our Democrats, they still talk about labor issues, like like union organizing and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I mean, they they may be failing just as as much as Democrats here in in making any kind of meaningful progress, but at least the rhetoric is is to the left of of where our parties are, both of them. Yeah, like Joe Biden. Like Joe Biden. That's- that's not left at all. Even no. though the right is so upset. Oh, oh boy. And thinks that he's just incredibly progressive and I'm like Yeah, the hyper. Have you looked just at the compass? Stop. He's not. No. Not yeah. at all. There was there was one guy who said recently, I didn't think that Biden would be left of Lenin. It's like what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have not seen Joe, you know, waving the hammer and sickle flag as as he comes down the, the aisle to give an address or whatever. He's, mm-hmm. he's he continues to lock up kids in cages. He's it may be a kinder, gentler uh, refugee camp, but it's it's still one. Yeah, he's still trying to re- like. Oh, I'm willing to work the both with sides the conservatives. Of- like, guess what? Mitch McConnell, all the rest of them, Ted Cruz, none of them care. Yeah, this is all just a cheap posture to try to get you off course, and it works because you right. take the bait every time. Right. Yeah, you, you get you get stuck up in a bogged down in like political infighting and, and across the aisle mudslinging and stuff like that, and you you lose track of, of real ideas and, and real solutions because neither of them are really offering them either. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, let, let, let's continue. on. Holders. Value is a bit of a deliberately vague term here, but most people interpret it to mean just heaps and heaps of money. Just big stacks of moolah. No one individual in a corporation has liability for the crimes of the entire thing, just whatever decisions they personally make. The, the liability of the crimes of the business belong to the legal person of the business. John Shell or Dave Nokia. That's what limited liability means. If you've ever seen LLC, it's Limited Liability Corporation. That's what that means. No one individual or even really a group of individuals is liable for crimes committed by the business as a whole. So like, say you're John Business. You're the CEO, <laughs> Chief Inter Gage Officer of John Co., a publicly was traded company so that jobs. produces tuxedos mm-hmm. for snakes. I would get it so turns many out jobs that the tuxedos are killing business. snakes. The bow ties are too tight, just pops their head right off. But the fine for killing snakes en masse represents a small portion of the revenue you receive for your tuxedos. So even if you personally love snakes, and who wouldn't, there's not a lot you can do. While you might not legally be required to kill snakes for your shareholders, they have pretty strong leverage over you. If you're bleeding heart snake loving bull... Important note though, which I don't think he even goes into in this video. They have leverage over you if together they have a controlling interest. And a lot of these companies, like especially like Facebook, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg and, and the other executives there, they have controlling interest. You have to have 51% of, of shares in order to make any decision. And if collectively, if all of you collectively have 49% and then the business itself has, has 51, you're at their win. Like, it, it, it's a very low bar to hit that fiduciary goal, mm-hmm. you know, as long as they can show, you know, with, with relative... Uh, certainty that they did their best to, to create a, a return for your investment that's all they really got to do so um just something to keep in mind that especially with these larger corporations you don't you can't really have control over them it's not as though we could all just get together and, and buy enough stocks to take over an amazon or a walmart or something like that because controlling interest is just not available but, yeah, just a side note. Bullshit gets in the way. They'll just fire you and replace you with a new CEO who hates snakes. 
And they don't even really care if you kill all the snakes and boom the business because all they have to do is wait until profits are projected to dip and then they just sell their shares and walk away. Shares will probably be more expensive until that time because they've been selling tuxedos like hotcakes. So it's the shareholders that have responsibility, right? They're the ones calling the shots. And yeah, sort of, maybe some of them, but a lot of them are going to be people who just invested in mutual funds or whatever or guys whose stock portfolios are managed by other businesses who likewise have a fiduciary responsibility to produce value for their shareholders. And the people at those companies might not even choose what companies they invest in. They've given that power to giant supercomputers who trade millions of times a second in deliberately obtuse and Byzantine ways that even their own tech people don't quite understand. And so you tie all of this together in this huge elaborate web of businesses running other businesses running other businesses in this endless feedback loop of limited liability decision deferral seemingly designed to force people to make profitable decisions at the expense of common sense where actual human decision making power is limited to doing whatever makes money regardless of the impact whether or not anyone actually wants to do it a human being intuitively understands that growth cannot continue forever we understand the concept of finite resources but this system and i hate to use that term because I know how it sounds to complain about the system, but what else are you going to call it, really? It's a system. It's like a, it's a big system. The system does not. It is a machine left running with no end condition. It's like a computer program with a stack overflow error. It'll just go and go and go until it can't anymore. It doesn't and can't care if everything along the way gets destroyed. And it's also kind of unclear if the people involved in the creation and maintenance of this system could even stop it if they want to, which they don't, of course, because it gives them absurd amounts of money, just science fiction, imaginary, theoretical numbers amount of money to have sex with or whatever they do with it. I'm not defending them. I'm just saying they're like Frankenstein, powerless in the face of the monster they have created. And likewise, we, the consumer, particularly those of us in the West, bear some responsibility for this too. We buy shit we don't need and throw away perfectly good shit that other people could use. The role of the individual consumer in this crisis is often used as a scapegoat by the capitalist class, but that doesn't mean we're without fault here. Let's be realistic. I don't need this DVD Blu-ray combo disc of Ghoulies 1 and 2. I bought it because I promised to record a commentary track for Ghoulies as a Patreon goal like two years ago, and I never did it, but for some reason, literally no one, not one single person has ever mentioned it to me. Like, I guess that wasn't as motivating a goal as I presumed it would be. There are generally two solutions proposed to fix the problem of capitalism's death drive towards infinite growth. If we're going to manage production so that it doesn't, you know, end the world, how do we do that? One idea is proposed by the worst scum on the planet, and the other by people who actually wish to fix this problem. Next week, we'll look at the bad idea, austerity. And the week after that, we'll look at the only option we have left, degrowth. And how that doesn't necessarily mean... That's, that's a really interesting concept. Degrowth. Have you have you heard of that before at all? Mm-hmm. Basically, it, it, it's the idea of, of shrinking economic production in a managed way, but with with an eye towards you know saving the environment, really. Mm-hmm. So creating. So only producing for the actual need. Yeah, and and producing a whole lot of a whole lot less like disposable stuff that just goes you know used for five seconds and it's it's right back out into the landfill that sort of thing. That's interesting because I feel like that should have been done a long time ago for like clothing. Oh yeah, clothing, clothing is absurd. The clothing industry is in a real bad state with the, the fast fashion stuff. Like instead of making so much fast trash, mm-hmm. make better quality stuff at affordable price. Yeah. Like a reasonable price, I should say, not necessarily affordable. Yeah. Well, and like even some of the companies that that used to make really high quality stuff. Um, like Duluth Trading Company, that's, that's one we have in Minnesota. And I used to really love the quality of their stuff, but then they got bought by another company who's taking it in a different direction. They still claim to be like worker clothing and stuff like that, but their stuff is just crap. They had, they had expensive boots there once and they, they ripped a hole in them in like the first couple of months I had them. I was, I was no good at all, but it seems to be the way of the industry in general. Like, I mean, you can still get some high quality stuff. Like, you got Coke and you got, you know. Oh, yeah, that's that, a good deal. It was Columbia, right? No, it was Carhartt. Oh, Carhartt. Yeah, Carhartt's still one of those companies that you can still count on. 
to make durable stuff. But those those are becoming few and far between at this point. It's a real shame. We really need a, a one eighty on that. And yeah. like you say, just invest in stuff well, that can last a longer time. You know, which has been kind of a trend lately. I mean, I've seen a lot of that push on me as a oh, woman, like capsule wardrobe. Okay. Don't go or don't go clothing shopping all the time. You only go clothing shopping when you need something. You ultimately, and I can't even say that I've done it, is you shop once a season mm. and then you're done. Yeah, I will. Okay. That, that's encouraging then. Let's hope that trend continues on. That's good. That's kind of fizzled out, but it was a good try. But I mean, there's so much waste in like any, any sector of the economy you can think of food waste or. You know, building material waste, like, you know, it's not like you can really even reuse most of the materials in modern buildings. They, you know, drywall, that's, mm-hmm. once you destroy that, that's it, that's it for it. You can't put it back together. <laughs> even the, the timbers and stuff tend to be low quality enough that you can't, there's no real economical way to deconstruct them out of a, a building. So, I mean, yeah, you can look at any sector like yeah, oh, I've, now you got me thinking about like food. Oh, food like is think bad. about elementary school kids. Oh man! Like, I would see lunch ladies take a hot lunch oh. away from a kid, throw it in the garbage, and give them a cold sandwich instead of just letting them eat the hot meal that that's already prepared. They already took yeah. because oh they didn't have enough money in their yeah. account. Yeah, that's like, just. I feel like you're shaming the child. Yeah, like like for the you know you should have worked harder in their lives. You should have done better at your job there, Timmy. No wonder you're not getting a hot lunch. You're just not giving it your all. <laughs> why Why would you want kids to go hungry? How is this something that... I mean, we're giving kids free education. But why are you throwing the food away? Well, right. I mean, right in front oh, of them. It, it definitely is to shame, you know, mm-hmm. the children first and then, and then the parents. But they only that. care about children so much. Like, stop. But like, yeah, I mean, we, we all agree that, 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 you know, socialized education, K through 12, is a wonderful and positive thing for the country. Hot take. Oh, boy, here comes a hot take. Kids in school should always get a free hot lunch. Yeah. I don't care what grade you're in. You're required to be in school. If you are going to school, you get a hot lunch. Yeah, because and a free breakfast. Well, I mean, good nu- good nutrition and learning. There's there's a huge tie in. I mean, there's study after study that mm-hmm. shows that kids that have eaten a good breakfast do better on tests. You know, and kids that the baseline needs are met absorb yeah. information better. Yeah. And, and kids that have you know unstable home lives where they may be a little bit food insecure. That's one less thing that they have to worry about. That's getting in the way of their right. schooling. Or even the kids that are food secure. Maybe we had a bad morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, on our way to school, we didn't get to have breakfast or whatever. Right. Like, just give it to them. Well, I mean, no matter what, taking taking that burden off of the parents as much as you can, that, that's only going to be good for everyone involved. Right, and the mom and dad don't have to feel bad. Right, well, no one has to feel bad. Right. Your kids don't have to be singled out. Like, it's hard enough being a poor kid and, and like, mm-hmm. you know, having, like, I, I, I didn't, I didn't experience it firsthand, but I definitely saw the kids who, like, they had to have the same jacket year after year because their parents couldn't afford it. You know, they, they didn't have good teeth because their parents couldn't afford dental work. You know, mm-hmm. it, you can tell which kids are not doing well or, or whose family is not doing as well. And that's already hard enough. Like, why make it even harder by, like, physically singling them out and, like, shaming Oh, yeah. Them? They know. Oh. <sighs> Well, on that happy note, yeah. let's continue. Okay. I mean, your life has to get worse. Hey, hey while we're on the subject of more happy stuff. out of okay. control, all-consuming forces in pursuit of infinite power, consequences be damned, while we're talking about powers far beyond any individual person's conception, acting in ways that are inscrutable to us in service to an agenda we don't understand but secretly fear. If you think about it, in, in a lot of ways, that's, that's kind of like the eyeball zone, if you think about it. It has a lot of similarities to the eyeball zone. Oh shit, I gotta do that. Hello and welcome to the eyeball zone. 
Here in the eyeball zone, we highlight small leftist projects that need some dang eyeballs stuffed into the empty crevice that used to be their body. We hollow them out and fill what remains with eyeballs until they are no longer them, they are us. Well, we're having a lot of fun, but let's all get really sad and angry. In her perhaps unfortunately named video, How Did We Get AIDS?, Little Hoot discusses the colonialist origin of the HIV AIDS pandemic through to how it spread throughout the United States. I knew a lot of the details of the story already, but it's one of those subjects that the more you look into it, the more shocking details you learn about just how much the powers that be did not value the lives of queer people, drug users, or out. On this topic, mm -hmm. the cost of HIV medication is $40,000 a month for generic. For generic? Yes. I mean, I, I knew they were doing some, like, really shady stuff, like, uh, you know, as soon as the, the drug would go generic, they would, they would uh, you know, change, like, one molecule chain mm -hmm. in the formula, and then they could just repatent it for another however many years and stuff like that, and then they could just stop manufacturing the generic mm -hmm. form. $40,000, that's... Criminal? That's insane. Yeah, and your insurance usually won't cover it. How is that possible? I thought we did away with like Because of how one comes to acquire this is through risky behaviors. Mm, that's, that's another part of society that needs to stop with the moralizing and, and judgment and stuff like that. Right. It just it doesn't do anyone need... I mean, they're still dying either way. That, that what does, what, you're just going to add to it by saying, well, you should have made a better decision. But... Like, that's literally on the question sheet for Harvard. I think it was Harvardy. I'm probably saying it wrong or mis mixing Havarti? up with something else. <laughs> the cheese that they're getting? It's some variation of starts, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> so, HIV drug, and it has questions about, like, your sexual behaviors. That's terrible. And all of that has to be filled out before insurance will even look at it. That's terrible. <sighs> yeah. Richest, richest nation in the world. Can't afford uh, free health care, though, for everybody. Mm -hmm. weird, weird how everyone else can. Not us, though. We're, we're special. We're exceptional. We're number one. Yeah, we're, num we're number we're one. We're number one at exploiting people. Yeah, and... and uh, Literacy in the developed nations and <laughs> teenage pregnancies. We're so awesome. Yay. America. Africans. Be prepared to be extremely mad when you watch it, but please do watch it. Because at the time of this recording, it only has 153 views, and it deserves at least a thousand times that. This is a subject that's difficult to confront, but this is not a difficult video to watch. Do you have a small project you'd like to see featured here in the eyeball zone? Send no more than one email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeball somewhere in the subject line and pertinent details like your pronouns, and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone. Loving the sound of those jackhammers. Thanks for watching the video. You know what I, what, what I need. You know what I crave. It's the <laughs> likes and subscriptions. Hand them over. This right, is a robbery now. I'm switching bits in the, the middle. Now it's a... Yeah, we need to fix something relatively quick. How about that three-minute oh, one about guns? Three-minute one about guns. Three-minute, 43-second democracy at work. Okay. This is Richard Walsh. Another Walsh's capitalist channel. problem here is that the NRA has masked itself it has masqueraded as a non-profit and it's a clever thing on the part of the gun industry they can't say buy a gun make us rich it's a much smarter thing to say be a man buy a gun protect your family protect your property there was an ad that was very big for the automatic bushmaster automatic rifle that adam lanza used to kill all those children they did take it off the internet after Adam Lanza's massacre. However, the ad was for a Bushmaster automatic rifle, and it said, does your wife or girlfriend 
make more money than you? Revoke your man card. Does your, do you prefer tofu to meat? Revoke your man card. Do you know how to find cilantro on the grocery list? Revoke your man card. It went down a whole list. It's like, why are these men so fragile? It's like, you can't even be a man if you know what cilantro is. I know what cilantro is. Do you think I'm not a man anymore? Well. <laughs> I'm glad you get to think about that. We also have tofu in the fridge. So we're oh, really we do have here. tofu. Oh, boy. Man. What, what were the other ones? Are, are you threatened that I take more home per paycheck than you? I'm so threatened by that. Like, I wish we had less money, really. I would rather have that so I could be a man. Like, I, this is silly. It's like, why does someone have to feel threatened by that? Well, and how is a gun going to fix any of that? Like, I, I, is, is it just like, you know, a gun is, is so much more manly that it just totally outweighs all these, these, these supposedly feminine things that you know? Or is it that you can, you can use that gun to somehow solve those problems? Mm-hmm. It's being posed like it could solve your problems. I it's know, like, and that's just like if you're if you're that insecure of a man, is it really good to push you in that direction? Like that seems like the like the it's way already that... delicate enough. And the funny part to me as a female is we are always labeled as like overly emotional, overly sensitive, yeah, and know. all these other things. It's like you sure have a lot of room to talk. Yeah. When you're okay. concerned about things like tofu or cilantro, cilantro like... or <laughs> your wife or girlfriend makes more than you. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, no. Wow. It's, I can't even imagine that mindset. Like to have so many things wrapped up in, in you maintaining your manhood and your man card and stuff. Like it's abstract. Yeah. There's nothing to do with anything. Right. Like the cilantro. That's not a, that's not a gendered food. That's <laughs> I, just, I can't I can't get over the cilantro. Like, if you like, I don't know, uh, making tacos, you probably know where the cilantro. You, you right. Probably have used cilantro. Unless you're before. one of those people who has that palate mutation where it tastes like soap, then you're not eating it. Yeah, but again, that has nothing to do with anything to do with, I just with thought it was gender or manhood. I know, I know, you're just joking, but just like just the absurdity of it all. Oh. Then it had cilantro. a picture. Bushmaster automatic rifle, and it said, Bushmaster automatic rifle. Reinstate your man card. In other words, you're a man. And as um, the Wall Street Journal first and then Mother Jones showed in this map, they made a map showing that the red states are also the states with the greatest male insecurity. They measured that in that they were the greatest picture was of penis enhancements and testosterone <laughs> creams. And I think that and And that's just sad that this, this is how the toxic forms of masculinity, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that masculinity as a broad stroke is toxic, but the, mm -hmm. the toxic versions of it the, the, that talk about things like a man card, it shows how much it hurts men as well. Right. Like it's not just it's not just oppressive to women, and it definitely is, and it definitely is more oppressive mm -hmm. and harmful to women, because women, you know, especially end up more often physically hurt by by these sorts of insecure men. But it hurts men too. Like no one should have their pride constantly battered down because they don't follow yeah. this very narrow version. Like people come in all shapes and sizes. Not everyone's going to be. You know, six foot four, naturally beefy, muscular man with a square jaw who's just gonna, you know, hunt and fish in all his spare super time. Chad. And, yeah, super Chad. Yeah, super, yeah. What, what do they call it? It's, it's not the Omega Chad. What? It's the Gig, Giga Chad. That's like the, the ultimate Chad. Have you ever <laughs> seen that one before? It's like this. No. He looks like a cartoon character, but apparently it's based on a real guy. And he just. This. this he looks like a balloon animal. He's got so many muscles popping out of, of every spot. Like, you, uh, you know, he probably can't even tie his own, or it's like tie his own tie or button his own shirt. It's like, yeah. 
It's sad because I think it harms little boys too. Absolutely. Especially the man up, don't be a pussy. Oh, like I feel so bad. Boys aren't supposed to cry. To that way. Like boys absolutely can cry. Well, yeah, because if you and if you if you don't let out your emotions, if you don't learn how to at least deal, deal with, with your them. emotions, mm-hmm. they come out in really icky ways. Icky ways, toxic ways. Imagine that. And if you have a whole lifetime built up of doing that sort of thing, and you get to adulthood. And you don't have those tools to deal with the, the, the sadness and tragedy that comes into every life. You know, at, at the very least, you're going to lose people that, that you love in your life due to, mm-hmm. to illness or old age or, or whatever. You, you know, relationships aren't going to work out. Everyone has sadness. And if you have no coping mechanisms that are positive for you at all, it, what, what's the alternative? Just bottling things up pretty much until mm-hmm. they just you know, flood out on some unsuspecting coworker or just someone on the street or some girl who turns you down. Or... And the funny thing is, is it goes the other way for women. Mm-hmm. Women that have more masculine attributes or what's viewed as stereotypically masculine. Right. They have a hard time. I can confess on this as being one of those women. Like, I'm very tall for a woman. I have a larger body. I've pushed a car out of a ditch. <laughs> But I'm not feminine enough. Like, I don't like wearing pink and ruffles and lace and all those things. But then, like, the second any emotion is shown at all, it's, like, shunned. Yeah. Like, pull it together. Yeah. Like, women who show emotion are not not taken seriously either. They're, they're, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're expected to have emotion, but then they're also expected to, you know... Like, there's a place where they're supposed to... Keep it to domestic areas. Quietly... Cry in the corner and dab your eyes. I mean, just just thinking back to the the fragility of of some of these men. Like, you're literally just, like, one inch taller than the average guy. Mm -hmm. And yet that's enough for a lot of men to be intimidated. Like, the number of men who can't date women that are even an inch taller than them is is absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they make a really big deal. Okay. I'm 5'10", way back in the day, I dated someone that was like 5'6". Yeah, which is not and that short just... of a guy either. That's like three inches shorter than average. So that's like that's like this much shorter than average. Still, it was such a big deal. I know. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, look so tall, like a mom. There's a mismatch. Like. Oh, he like, went that route. He was like. Oh, this is my Amazon queen that I can yeah. watch. Oh, ooh. it was gross. I, like I felt really uncomfortable. I was like, do we have to hone in on this one attribute like this? Yeah, like a physical attribute, not like oh, you're really funny or you're really nice. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure there are some people that do like having parts of their their body or, or appearance fetishized, but for a lot of people, they don't. Cause it's yeah, it feels objectifying. It's like. You don't really care about me as a person. You just like this one thing about me. That, mm-hmm. you know. It's like something to show up. Right. And like, there are websites for people with fetishes. Yeah. So if that's your jam, yeah, use the right tool. Yeah. Find find someone else who's into that, or 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 S- someone or, who's going to be more receptive to it anyway. Right. Yeah. Put the, you know put that stuff out there ahead of time. That, that's usually a good route to usually. do. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, if you if you expect any sort of real relationship with somebody, you shouldn't be starting out by by holding back on things that are really important that may sway the, the future of the relationship in one way or another. Right. It's right. like when, when, when we first met, we met on a, a dating profile thing, and I put right on the front, hey, just so you know, I have three kids, and I'm in their lives, you know, on a, on a very regular basis so you're gonna have to be okay with that because i didn't ever want that sort of thing to you know come out in an opportune time and have to go, oh well uh oh, that's not really what i was looking for like why mm-hmm. why waste each other's time with that sort of thing you know there's there's a lot of power in in uh putting putting yourself out there just just you as get a you more are. sincere connection with people right. when you put everything up front right or, you know, most of it up front. I totally agree with that. That's cool. Man, look at this map of, of you know, stuff about 
insecure. They're a lot of good girls. Penis size. Oh, tall. by the way, mm-hmm. hot tip. Those how to get girls videos, they don't work. Try saying hi. Mm-hmm. How are you? Having a legit conversation. Yeah, well, I think yeah, I think the legit part that that's kind of the the, the most important part of that. If if you're if you're coming into any sort of potential with a dentist system, knock it off. <laughs> We're not interested. We had a system. meeting. Right. Right. If you if you're looking just to manipulate and say the right thing so you can get to the end, well, I mean, you know, people are manipulatable to a certain extent, but and you will get caught. You get caught, and and if you actually want anything real, then you're going to sabotage yourself. You're going to you're going to sab- sabotage yourself. Yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, go into go into any sort of potential new relationship. With with no other intentions than I want to get to know you. I think that's that's perfectly reasonable for mm-hmm. for anybody. No one's gonna say. I mean, there are gonna be people that are gonna shut you down, no matter what, and, and that's fine. It's, yeah. it's nothing to do with you because they don't know you. Obviously, if you're just approaching a stranger and you say hi, hey, how's it going? You're at a bar or whatever, and and they aren't receptive of that. Okay. So you so you move along. They they couldn't possibly know anything about you in order to to make a judgment. Right. right. Not everybody likes chocolate ice cream. Sure. Yeah. Pick something else. Pick something else. It's not a big deal. Let's go on. It has nothing to do with you. You just you just need to move along. And I think that's that's what we should be teaching. We should boys. we should be giving dating advice. Oh, absolutely. We should make a sex ed channel too. Oh boy. Yeah, here we go. Here come the ideas spiraling out of control. Yeah. If if men were taught consent and and what that really means, and, and just about, you know, any relationship, not just mm-hmm. potential romantic or sexual partners. And if, if men were taught how to accept rejection gracefully and to not internalize like or women personalize. women are supposed it, to. Right. Um, I think the world would be a much scarier, a much less scary place mm-hmm. for, well, especially women. But, but everyone. Involved. Over everybody. You know, you wouldn't be as scared going into a potential rejection scenario because you would know that it's it's not yeah, really like it's okay. about you. Yeah. It's, the rejection opens you up for a better situation. Yeah. Because that one clearly wasn't going to be good for you. Right. And why waste your time? Why waste anyone's time? You just say, okay, and you move on. Right. Yeah, it's, it's as easy as that. I think yeah. I think that's a much better thing to do than... Mm-hmm. Put, wrap your entire, you know, self worth and, and and emotional state for the day into one hit or miss scenario where if the the, the woman at the bar talks to you um, and seems interested, well then you've won, and then mm. everything is going to happen exactly as you want. And if they don't seem interested at all, well you have a completely bruised ego, and you better you know. Call them a name as, as you you know run off oh, the that tail. Oh, that's the best one. And they make fun of you. Yo, I didn't want you them. anyway. It's like yeah, like that's you're so a lesbian. I was like, because that's the worst thing. Yeah. Well, okay. Then why did you hit on me? If, if, right. Like, yeah. how, wouldn't you've known I was gay? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't you've known that ahead of time? If that was such a big deal for you. So. Yeah. It's just cheap shots. Yeah. To make and themselves feel better, and it, it's. That's that toxic part that, that's that's damaging to men too. Yeah. You can't and wrap not, up your entire psyche in, in single interactions. And it's not okay for them to be sad about being rejected. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a womanly thing. Yeah. I mean it's okay to feel sad about it. It's okay to, to get your hopes up and then and then be let down. That yeah. happens in life. Mm-hmm. But can you, like what do you do when you don't get a job you interviewed for? Yeah, are you gonna are you gonna call them up and you know <laughs> Oh, I don't want to work for you anyway. I have five other interviews them. this yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is not going to make you feel better about yourself, really. And it's certainly not going to get you that job. No one, no one is ever going to be like, oh, oh, you wait know a that minute. Guy that threw the now that you verbally tantrum? abused me, I can see what kind of an upstanding person you are, and I'm going to give you a second chance. Right, like you're just really passionate. You're just a really passionate dude, so. Yeah. Total management material. (laughs) 
Okay, those ads kind of this, we'll for men who have been left left in the streams, like we're going to end at, at of their more nine o'clock jobs. here in just a few minutes. Is there anything in the chat? Makes why? Um, it doesn't. It's not showing up on my phone, but I'll I'll check. I'll check up in here. No, nope, that's the last one for for now. And that's fine. It's probably going to take us a while of, of streaming at this time to really get any sort of regular following. That's just how it goes with Twitch. You know, it's the live experience. In guns reinstating people's manhood and that's a particular problem in the united states we do have more guns per person than anyone else but canada has loads of guns but they don't kill one another finland these are hunting states hunting nations they have loads of guns they're not using them against each other so it isn't just that the guns are there it's that they're used to address loneliness and to address the absence of feeling manly and well that's gender and um class and capitalism really are evident i feel like there's another facet i want to add to this sure white men specifically well i mean that, that's predominantly the ones who go on mass shooting sprees and, and mm -hmm. will and end up killing spouses and, and ex-girlfriends and Right. Or ex-lovers of any kind. Um, but I feel like this is who a lot of those ads are targeted to. Absolutely so. And even if a black man suggests, like, I have a gun to protect my family, mm -hmm. it's not taken that way. Right. No, it's they're just taken instantaneously as a seen as a threat. Right. Even when they're not. But, it, but I, I think you are right. These all, all, these all kind of, you know, reinforce one another. Mm -hmm. You know, capitalism plays up on your, your insecurities so, so that you, you you sell more units because insecurity is one way that you can uh, boost sales. Um, and then white supremacy plays on the, well, you used to be at mm -hmm. the top of the pecking order, white man, and now you no longer are. So this is a way to regain your former glory right. and, and show everyone who is who deserves to be in charge in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. So it, it all, it all, and then, you know, and then sexism too, just, you know, uh, this is a way that you can project yourself into the world as a man, men have power, men take action, men, this, that, and the other thing, all of these play in on each other. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to dismantle all of them. But. Those two countries that you mentioned have very strong social safety nets. Just a country's structure, having a social safety net, makes people feel like they're part of something. Mm. This is something that I talk about all the time when I'm, when I'm doing my theory books, uh, is that rather than, you know, the conservative trope is always you know, the, the social safety net becomes a hammock and then people are less motivated to, to get up off their butts and, and go in and, and try and make something of themselves. I think the exact opposite ends up actually being the truth. When you give people the dignity of having food and shelter and, and security of, of, of every material kind that, that you can have, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to feel good enough about themselves that they can do, do something this. big with their life. They can, you know, get that job or get yeah. a better job or, or start they have something Because a place better. to shower. Uh -huh. Some place to leave from, go home to. Right. Some place to keep their things nice. Right. And they're not constantly being battered down by, right. by having to work, you know, as we talked about earlier, three mm -hmm. or, or, or I'm sure even four jobs sometimes just to make ends meet. They have a platform that, that they can, you know, push off of. And, right. And it's a springboard. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's definitely something to be said about having to work constantly and that, you know, wearing down your, your mental state and, and your, your, your ability to, to manage your stress more and more because mm -hmm. there's no end in sight. It's just, it's just you see work ahead of you and that's all. Right. Whereas if you have this, this place to... to rest even for a bit you know i think that changes that equation quite a bit so i, I really like that they're pulling in this this element of the, the social safety net mm -hmm. as a bare minimum like you know
know, they're talking about countries that are, are still predominantly capitalist in nature. I mean, they still have employees and employers, um, but they have robust safety nets. So, like, you know, it seems to me that's just the bare minimum if we want to solve a lot of these problems is just getting to that point where we can call ourselves mm-hmm. even a social democracy, you know, of, of the Scandinavian type. And again, people who say, oh, it works there, but it can't work here. We're, we're, again, we're the, we're the richest nation in history, the U.S. is. The richest nation in history. And to say that we can't do anything that other countries do in terms of, of social programs, it's ludicrous. Absolutely yeah. ludicrous. We choose not to. Or we, we don't choose not to. But the, the people that have the ears of, of congressional people, they choose not to. Right. They're part of something where they care for each other and they will be cared for. And I think, you know, the United States, we have Social Security, but it's a constant fight by the forces, you know, of, of fascism to to take it away, to ruin it, to destroy it, to chip away at it, to undermine it. And it's 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 not just that we still have it that makes it good. It's the it's the conversation around how it shouldn't be there and it should be this rugged individualism and then when people go down the road toward rugged individualism they wind up being these sort of lone gunmen for lack of a of a better that's right. term yeah like that seems a pretty easy connection to make if, you, if you're a rugged individual and everything is individual choice and individual uh standing on your own two feet and getting this um, status symbol or that status symbol. No wonder those people end up being very lonely and isolated people and, and just mm-hmm. society in general, the way that it's, it's pushed through the constant beat of consumerism. Um, no wonder people feel so atomized and alone because they're being pushed in that direction. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah. That was a good video to end with. I actually like that one a lot. A little less doom and gloom than some of the other stuff we saw tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, going to have this video up on YouTube as soon as possible. Um, I think Twitch makes you wait at least 24 hours before you can put your stuff up there. But uh, I thank you all, uh, people who have come in and out, for joining us tonight. I hope to see you in future streams. Yeah, um, the conversation was really good. It was nice to talk to people. Yeah, definitely. Definitely nice to have that interaction, even if it was people that tended to be detractors from, from what we're saying. That's okay. As long as, like, like I always say, as long as you can be uh, respectful. respectful. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just use that word. Respectful about it and, and not go off on unproductive ways. Like As long as you listen and you're actually willing to have a real conversation, then yeah, I'm willing to have you on the channel. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is, this is the first time I've done this sort of kind of uh, just reaction video, sort of a stream, but uh, it was definitely a fun time. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed doing it with you, yeah. having someone to talk to when the, there was no one in the chat. So, and then uh, I do my theory stream where I, I stream leftist audiobooks. We're we're currently going through the Conquest of Bread. Going to have a, a different guest on this Friday night for that one, and I do that every Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. So, yeah, just keep, keep those days in mind. Uh, Fridays and Sundays, 7 p.m. Central. Um, if you go to Linktree and you search bread underscore theory, you can find links to all my different projects and all my different social medias and all that sort of thing. Get connected up that way. I did just create a Discord finally. Um, so maybe in the future, maybe we'll get to the point if we have regular people enough that we'll be able to do, like, call in and, have more interaction that that's that's away from from the live show but I, i'm not quite ready to to go live with that i'm still learning a lot about setting up a discord server so but but you know keep your eyes out for it i'll be announcing that soon enough so that uh we can have like i said just another place to, to interact so thanks so much for being my my guest and my partner in crime tonight I had a lot of fun mm-hmm. doing it with you me too all right well we will see you guys Hopefully this Friday, 7 p.m., right at the same spot.